the Global War Strategy Map. Much of the strategy of this war is based upon the modern airplane. Its speed, size, and dependability permit military operations across areas impo impassable to surface transport. The great land areas of the world are grouped around the North Pole. The shortest routes between many of the world's great centers lies across polar regions. Conventional maps do not bring out these facts. They do not show the transpolar relationship of the continents. In many ways, they are actually misleading. This map has the North Pole as its center. It is an air strategy map. It clearly indicates the immense savings of distance which air transport would make possible. It shows the reasons why world powers are fighting for building air bases in the Arctic regions. Study of this map also shows why there is much concern over post-war control of the air, the use of transport planes, blah, 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 blah. The nation's bases, da, da, da. The airplane has redrawn the map of the world. It has changed its size and shape and made us look at the world from a new viewpoint. Let's say we wanted to fly between Santiago and Sydney. If the Earth was flat, which way would we go? Well, the straight line path would go up across all of South America, all of North America, over Alaska, and then continuing all the way until we get to Sydney. So, do any airlines actually fly between these cities? Yes. Do they follow this straight line? Nope. They do the whole thing over the Pacific Ocean. But which way do they go? Do they follow this straight line? Nope, they do the whole thing over the Pacific Ocean. They do the whole thing over the Pacific Ocean. Let's see. Santiago, Chile, okay. And we're going to pull this twat. We're going to pull it tight. Toit. Toit, okay. And so following this straight line, straight line, they do the whole thing over the Pacific Ocean. Here's how that trip looks on a globe. New Zealand, okay. Hmm. Oh, and which way is it curving, Dave, because it's on the bottom side of the globe? Oh, yes, I see, I see, and that would be a straight line. Okay. They do the whole thing over the Pacific Ocean. It takes 14 hours and 15 minutes going west, and 12 hours and 25 minutes going east. On a flat earth, that route would look like this. Do they follow this straight line? Nope. They do the whole thing over the Pacific Ocean. On a flat earth, that route would look like this. On a flat earth, that route would look like this. An absurdly long and totally unnecessary arc. For comparison, how long does it take to fly between New York City and London? It's about seven hours going east and about eight hours going west. Far across the river, can you hear freedom calling, calling me to answer? I keep on keeping on, I can feel it in my bones. And I know what's around the bend. To face cause I'm alone And I just might fail But Lord knows I tried Sure as stars fill up the sky Stand up, take my people with me Together we are going To a brand new home Far across the river can you hear freedom calling, calling me to answer? I wanna keep on keeping on, I can feel it in my bones. I go, I go.
Now, you tell me, does it make sense that a plane would travel this enormous arc? Now, you tell me, does it make sense that a plane would travel this enormous arc? First of all, the fact that these are arcs at all is totally nonsensical. Planes don't constantly turn slightly left or right. They lock into a flight path and go straight. And today's flights uh, will be overflying the following countries from England to Netherlands, Germany, Poland, Belarus, Russia, Kazakhstan, China, Philippines, Indonesia, and on to Australia. So how do flat earthers deal with this information? Well, for the longest time, they simply denied that these Southern Hemisphere flights exist at all. Well, it makes sense that they exist. So when did they exist? Oh, right at the end of 2019, at the end of the world. So they began at the end of the world when pretend started. In this graphic yanked from a website saying this is the flight path that will take place when a direct flight is introduced in 2019. And the map is total bullcrap. That arc is going the wrong way. The flights are a nail in the coffin for Flat Earth, so they would just lie and say there aren't any. But since anyone can find out that they definitely do exist in about 10 seconds of Googling, Some of them have had to start coughing up explanations. The most popular of these is to pretend that the wind is responsible. Again, this is because flat earthers are lazy. Small differences in flight times going east versus west occur because planes fly with or against wind currents. So they just take this concept and bring it to an absurd conclusion. They will evoke currents of several hundred miles per hour, which would be a world record hurricane, and pretend that the plane is somehow traveling twice as fast as usual without anyone noticing. There are several problems here. First of all, this boost from the imaginary wind still isn't anywhere near enough. This arc is stupid long. Second, this flight goes both directions, east and west. How does the wind know which way the plane is going?
That's why pretending this is a real map is stupid. And that's why Flat Earth priests pretend the Southern Hemisphere doesn't exist. It ruins everything for them. As for their whining that flights don't travel over Antarctica, well, there's no reason for them to do that. The shortest path, which we call a great circle for any common route, doesn't pass directly over Antarctica. Some get pretty close, like Johannesburg to Melbourne. If it were to be flown, Johannesburg to Christchurch would nick the edge of Antarctica. But this isn't a regular flight. Why? Because the latter isn't a major city, so not enough people would be interested in the flight so as to make the route profitable for an airline. In fact, there are very few large cities in the Southern Hemisphere in general. Because of the way the continents are distributed around the Earth, 90% of the human population lives in the Northern Hemisphere. But much to the dismay of Flat Earth priests, the Southern Hemisphere still exists, and its existence is single-handedly enough to make them cry like toddlers that found out the Easter Bunny isn't real. So that's it. Airplanes. Ask any airline pilot what the shape of the Earth is. When they're done laughing at you, they'll tell you it's a sphere.
you can see it's, it's kind of a non-event. You know, here 1.2, 1.4. Uh, there's no real difference between you know 0.9 and 1.4 as far as what the jet's doing. This is such a history-making flight. <laughs> Project Sunrise, here we come. Overcoming the final frontier of aviation, Qantas non-stop research flight from London to Sydney. Here I come. 19 hours and 17 minutes. Darkness when we depart, bright sunshine in Sydney when we land. And we'll see double sunrise we today. We will see double sunrise today. And uh, look at the pillow here, it says Qantas research flight. Thanks very much Good. London. We'll see you when we come back next time. Thank you. Thank you. Final Let's go! If your seat is filled with a sash belt, ensure it's separate from the pouch by pulling the tab. Mind if I just pull this over for you? Oh yeah. yes, I forgot. It's, the it's shoulder extra, strap. Yeah, it's a safety precaution. So like a car seat. Oh, like a car yeah. seat, yes. Thank yeah. you very much. There we go. And it'll very stop nice. you from... All secured. Not that you're going to need it at all. Thank you. So the time now is 6 a.m. So we pushed back a few minutes early. We're heading towards the end of runway 27 left for departure and as you can see it's still pitch dark and slightly with uh, rain just to take off 19 hours 17 minutes to Australia non-stop in 1919 a hundred years ago it used to take 28 days from UK to Australia so today is 19 hours we'll get there and there's okay. also a little bit of information in here about the flight as well yeah thank you very much a historic event there you go thank you so Sam on this flight um, we've locked the windows closed in the forward two sections where our customers are sitting because we have a trial on this flight for the Charles Perkins uh, method of getting everyone under the time zone in Sydney. So in honour of your place in this epic adventure, we acknowledge the personnel who took part in the top secret double sunrise flights that Qantas conducted during World War II. These flights were under constant threat of attack from the Japanese and would fly for up to 32 hours non-stop. The crew and their passengers would see two sunrises on their flights, giving them the title of the double sunrise flights. Today, as we've departed London in the wee small hours of darkness, the first of our two sunrises is just about to occur on the horizon to our east now. Beautiful. This is the magic moment of the day. The first sunrise we saw on this flight, uh, just about 40 minutes after took off, and uh, as we're flying towards the east. Most passengers are in the front cabin on this flight. They will acclimatize to Sydney time zone, which is actually now in the evening. Now, Helen, can you tell me how much fuel uplifted from London to do this non-stop to Sydney? Sam, the flight plan, we needed 100 tonnes of fuel today. The takeoff weight for the aeroplane is uh, nearly 235 tonnes, so that's 235,000 kilograms. Uh, when we get to Sydney, we'll be landing uh, at about 137,000 kilograms. So we'll burn a fair bit of the fuel on the way, but we're running a very fuel efficient flight today. And we've got a lot of computers and performance engineers monitoring our fuel flow. You could even take up more passenger. We could have taken more today. Yeah, we had about 20,000 kilos below our maximum takeoff weight. So we had a bit more room for a few bodies, but uh, we couldn't get anybody in the terminal to hop on. You can see the entire economy class behind me is empty and also the premium economy is also empty. All the guests and passengers are sitting in the front of the plane. At this point now, at the left side of the aircraft, you'll see your second sunrise. And now we are all members of the rare and special secret order of the double sunrise and trailblazers for Project Sunrise. A century ago, the Australian government challenged the world's leading aviators to fly from Great Britain to Australia in less than 30 days. Brothers Captain Ross Smith and Lieutenant Keith Smith and their mechanics Sergeants Wally Shears and Jim Bennett took off in their modified Vickers Vimy bomber from snow-covered Hounslow Aerodrome in West London on the morning of November 12, 1919. Some 135 hours of actual flying time later, on the 10th of December, the four touched down at Fanny Bay in the Northern Territory of Australia near Darwin and shared a prize of £10,000. Their flight is considered one of the world's great pioneering aviation feats. And today we replicate that challenge in a flying machine they could never have imagined in just on 19 hours of flying time.
So that was so inspiring. Like, I'm sure your grandfather is very, very proud of you. Thanks. And Chris, what, what's this thing you're holding with you? So this here is a uh, brainwave monitor. Um, we are required to wear it um, at all times we are on the flight deck. Um, so it actually just sits on our forehead. It's just behind our ears on both sides. Designed so that uh, our headset can sit on our ears comfortably and the microphone boom in front of our uh, mouth without any hindrance. Um, it measures our brainwave activities. I want to ask you, which aircraft you think is more likely, the A350 or the 777X? We're talking to both manufacturers, both have pros and cons. Oh. So this will come down to the line. It's going to be at the. It's going to be to the very last minute before we'll make a call. Okay, when do you think you will make that call? So our, our intent is by the end of this calendar year, which is only a few weeks away, uh, that we will be making a decision on whether we do sunrise or not. Oh, so there's a chance sunrise may not even happen. To allow us and um, to make sure we're comfortable, we're having a tour of duty that could do a 21 hour flight, do a 21 hour flight. How's the flight so far? We... I'm impressed at how well I'm feeling. But also there isn't, there aren't 200 people at the back. So there isn't the same humanity. There isn't the same movement around carts going up and down, although there are in some cases, uh, there isn't just that same feeling of, of pressure and crowdedness. Uh, I'm feeling pretty good. Oh, Sam, welcome to the club of uh, Double Sunrise. Oh, very small thank elite you. club you've now great. joined. Thank you very much. Look at this. So this is the original replica of the certificate that used in your shoe back when the flying boat services started. Oh, the original. This is the replicating. Oh, wow. And on the other side, you've got uh, the new model. The new one. Well, we are just about an hour and a little bit more until we arrive in Sydney. I think you can recognize these are the typical Australian outback landscape. Um, the meal I had, the lunch was phenomenal. It was a great dish. The pasta with the beef ragu. Our track today uh, inbound towards Sydney from the west. We're going to do a right turn just before we reach Sydney City itself. Track down towards the south for a series of left turns and then landing on runway 3 for the left towards the north. Touchdown time at this stage looks like 12.28. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for accompanying us today on such a special trip. It's been an epic adventure for all of us. We look forward to catching up with you on the ground and enjoying all the revelry that goes with such a flight. Thank you and good afternoon. 7879, the threshold wind is 320 degrees, 10 knots, that's runway 34 left, clear to land. What a great arrival into Sydney. This is such a history-making flight. In fact, I think this research flight will shape up the future of aviation. I'm extremely privileged to be on this flight. And I'm actually feeling great, even flying after 19 hours. Everyone waiting for you. Have you got some tissues? Oh, this is very emotional. Like, this is amazing. Thank you.